I will be introducing Jim Plummer, which I'm delighted to do. It's a great pleasure for me to do that. I did, because I have one minute for this introduction, I did type out uh, an introduction, and then I found when I got here that I'd brought the wrong one. <laughs> so I'm gonna wing this, Jim. <clears throat> uh, Jim uh, came to us from UCLA to do his graduate work in integrated circuits. Uh, he finished his PhD in 1971. He joined that lab, became a faculty member in 1978, and proceeded to a, an extraordinary career, in, uh, particularly in the subjects of high power electronics, integrated circuits for SAME, uh, and inventing uh, the insulated gate field effect transistor, which was a major invention. Um, he uh, succeeded that work, he followed that work with a couple of decades of work in, uh, in creating and improving Supreme with Bob Dutton and lots of students. And he wrote an extraordinary textbook on uh, VLS signal processing and VLSI. So that was already an illustrious career. And then he agreed with some uh, arm twisting to be our Dean of Engineering. Um, in that capacity, uh, he did something which is ex truly extraordinary from my point of view. To put it simply, he brought us into the 21st century. Faculty now do work across disciplines, both they and their students. Uh, that was one of the major uh, event, a major change in the school. Um, two other things that I will mention and then bring Jim up here. Um, he built the most beautiful campus for engineering that has yet been built, as far as I know. Um, and um, he, when he left, every single department had facilities that had been upgraded to what they needed to be for the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Jim Plummer. Well, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Um, I mostly want to talk about the future. Um, there, are going to be, there have been and will be some really interesting discussions during the day about the history of the electrical engineering department, but I'd like to uh, spend the, the time that I have actually thinking about the future. Um, in, in some ways, I think you can make the argument that the last several decades, not just for this electrical engineering department, but actually for EE departments across the country, have been kind of a golden era, uh, where EE departments have been the biggest, strongest, baddest departments in colleges of engineering and have recruited the best students and so on. And if we want to think about the next 50 years, then I think we need to ask what lessons have we learned as to why that happened uh, over the last several decades and how does that position us or not uh, to have an illustrious future over the next several decades. So I guess I'd like to start by um, a little bit of uh, history and I'm actually going to pick up on some of the things that John Hennessy talked a bit about here but perhaps put a slightly different spin on them since I'm a technology person and John is a uh, computer architecture person. I think the question I'd like to ask is, what is it that made EE departments, not just ours, but EE departments around the country, uh, so dominant uh, over a multi-decade kind of a time period? And part of the answer, I think, is that uh, arguably the biggest opportunities in engineering in those decades uh, were computing systems and communication systems, and they were both fueled by the developments in silicon chips. So if you look at uh, how that played out over several decades, uh, electrical engineering departments, not only our doubly department, but others, actually own silicon chips and photonics technology. Uh, doubly departments uh, own computing systems all the way from technology up to architecture. And doubly departments own communication systems all the way from technology all the way up to theory. So it was a unique time, uh, I think, in history where a single department basically owned the critical technology and owned the most important applications of that technology. So that really provided the opportunity. 
Now, if you look what happened as a consequence of that, uh, you can look at history and see that doubly e attracted great faculty. We attracted uh, the best students wanted to be in electrical engineering because they, if they were interested in technology, the most interesting technology was silicon chips and photonic technology. If they wanted to work on systems, the most interesting systems were computing systems and communication systems. So. We were doing that in universities, we and others. Uh, Silicon Valley grew up around us and provide the commercial opportunities, both in the technology and also in the um, uh, systems areas for computing and communication systems. And uh, engineering schools nationwide made significant investments in EE departments. They typically grew to be the biggest, boldest, baddest departments uh, in uh, schools of engineering around the country in that time frame. So what was, uh, if you look back on this historically, of course it's always easy to kind of rewrite uh, history, what, what was the strategy that uh, EE departments used to kind of play this whole thing out and become, you know, sort of the dominant departments in, in schools of engineering? I think you can make an argument that as far back as 1960, uh, and certainly by 1970, uh, EE departments uh, had a vision. And they really saw that uh, because of uh, silicon chips and what was predictable over the next several decades, uh, certainly communication systems and computing systems were gonna be revolutionized. And there was no reason that EE departments couldn't take ownership of uh, both the technology and the principal application areas. So EE departments, not just ours, but departments around the country, uh, took that vision and they built the foundations uh, to enable them to become uh, dominant, really, in, in all, these, uh, all these areas. So they built programs in solid state, in integrated circuits. Uh, they built experimental facilities. Here, the CIS building was a good example, uh, to enable the technology to be worked on by people uh, largely in electrical engineering departments. Uh, they also built bridges uh, to critical partners uh, in computer science. This was the time in the early 80s when Jim Gibbons brought the computer science department into the School of Engineering and established deep partnerships with electrical engineering through the computer systems lab, which John was part of. So uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the partnerships with uh, applied physics and material science and so on provided the technology connections for electrical engineering. And very importantly, uh, electrical engineering faculty took on leadership roles in all of these areas, both in the technology area and also in the uh, applications areas, communication systems, computing systems. Now, similar things happen at other places as well. You can look at all of our peer institutions and make the same kind of set of arguments. And what's interesting is that because, um, in retrospect, because electrical engineering faculty took leadership roles in the most important technology and the most important application areas in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, fast forward a decade or two and look at who became engineering deans, who became provosts, who became presidents of not just Stanford, but uh, MIT and our other peer institutions, and it was the, the representation of electrical engineering faculty in those positions is way disproportionate to the uh, size of double departments. And I think, in fact, um, one of the reasons for that was the fact that EE faculty stepped up and really saw a leadership opportunity and they were recognized for those opportunities with subsequent leadership roles. So um, what made all this possible? So this, this picture uh, kind of uh, begins with uh, dividing the world into two pieces. So on the left-hand uh, side, there was, of course, the set of mostly double E faculty who were working on silicon technology. And they were working on density doublings and lower power, fancy designs uh, for new devices. They were working on you know, introducing new materials like high-K dielectrics and, and so on into the technology realm. And then at the other end of the double E spectrum, there were people who were in the uh, system application areas working on communication systems and computing systems who were working on new kinds of computer architecture ideas, who were working on um, using faster chips and so on to create and design interesting new systems. So what's interesting about this is that you could look at this and you could say, how could this happen? You know, how could the technology people and the systems people uh, have been so well coordinated. How could it have happened that you know the, the developments in system technology came along at the same time there were rapid changes in the technology? And you might say, well, 
uh, it must be the case that the people in the systems area were, were really closely talking with the people in the technology area and vice versa about what's possible or what's, what's not possible. In fact, uh, that wasn't the case, uh, I would argue. And what actually provided the connection between these two worlds was the existence of two things. Uh, one of them was Moore's Law, uh, which we all know, um, which predicted the doubling in density every couple of years. But just as important, and perhaps even more important, was something called the uh, International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, or the ITRS. And this began uh, around about 1980 and was subsequently updated every couple of years. And it provided a very detailed roadmap for how technology would evolve, silicon technology, over the next decade or even two decades. So in fact, uh, what happened in that time period is the, the people on the left-hand side here uh, saw Moore's Law, saw the ITRS, and they knew exactly what they had to do. So they basically could work on faster transistors, more dense technologies on introducing new materials and so on because they had a roadmap of exactly where they were supposed to go. The people on the right-hand side of this who were working on system applications actually could look at this and say, okay, I know what's gonna be available in two years. I know what's gonna be available in four years. In fact, I know what's gonna be available in a decade. And so I can think about computing systems and communication systems and think about what might be possible in new kinds of architectures, new kinds of system opportunities and so on. So in many ways, the glue that made all of this possible, I think, was the existence of Moore's Law and the existence of the ITRS, which chunked along year after year after year. And it wasn't necessarily that there was terrific communication uh, and coordination between these, the systems people, the systems builders, and the technology people. So for 40 years, I would, I would say that the system and technology communities actually worked largely independently. But the glue that tied them together uh, was Moore's Law and the ITRS. And that's what made this golden era where People working in the technology area could be publishing wonderful papers on new device structures. People in computer systems area could be publishing equally wonderful papers on new uh, wireless communication systems or computing systems. And they both made tremendous progress year after year after year because they knew what the other group was going to do. So what's happened in the last uh, 10, uh, 10 years or so, 10 or 20 years, and this picks up on some of the things that John talked about earlier this morning. Um, Moore's Law is at least slowing down, uh, and you can argue well, if it's dead or not. I don't think it is, but it's at least slowing down. And John talked a bit about the, the power issues and the clock frequency issues and the fact that uh, real progress was made for a while and, multi and by basically multi-core chips and so on. <clears throat> you can... Uh, list a number of factors that would cause you to worry about the fact that Moore's Law is actually slowing down. Um, lots of chip designers, uh, John said this this morning, Bill Daly says it all the time, you know, that the technology isn't providing them much in terms of performance enhancements anymore. It's really coming from uh, application-specific designs, which is what uh, John talked about. Uh, another example, Intel took five years uh, rather than the typical two to go from 14 to 10. So there's, there's a clear slowing down and they claim the next one's gonna be two um, years, but we'll see. Uh, another interesting thing is if you, if you look at the uh, improvements from technology generation to generation, uh, this is showing for Samsung and TSMC, some IEEE spectrum data, that shows how much improvement there is in uh, performance and power each node of the technology. And uh, I, can, I can take those lines and extrapolate them to where they hit zero, actually, in about uh, two more generations. Now, in fact, that's probably not gonna happen. There will be incremental improvements, but the message is that it's really getting hard and it's really slowing down the rate at which technology is able to uh, produce new, uh, new, new generations. In fact, as we know, there's only three companies that are actually pursuing advanced technology generations and the costs are exploding. So th this is the, oh, oh my goodness, scenario. You know, what's gonna happen uh, if, if we don't have Moore's Law to depend upon in the same way we have in the past? 
So John talked about the fact that in traditional areas for electrical engineering, computing and communication systems, the implications are that uh, application-specific designs are going to become increasingly important. That's also why companies like uh, Google and Facebook and Apple and so on all have their own internal design teams because they're customizing the designs of chips uh, to get the performance that they want from generation to generation. <clears throat> so. The, the thing I really want to focus on uh, going forward here then is since Moore's Law is arguably slowing down, the ITRS, the last version of it was published in 2013. It's been gone since then. There is no ITRS today. So there is no roadmap that basically says what's going to happen generation to generation of technology. It's kind of the, the three companies are charting their own course and picking their own pathway. and. They're going to do what they're going to do, but there is no industry pathway for uh, improving technology going forward. <clears throat> More importantly, and this is really what I want to focus on for the rest of the time that I have, there is nothing that I'm aware of in any other application area which is equivalent to Moore's Law or the ITRS. And if you believe my argument that the connection between people working on technology and people working on systems came from Moore's Law and the ITRS in this golden age for electrical engineering, the fact that there is nothing equivalent to that uh, means that if we're going to have another golden age for electrical engineering, it's going to have to be differently structured than the, the age we've just gone through in computing and communication systems. So you've all seen, the, uh, Christina mentioned this actually, the National Academy of Engineering, uh, 21st century, big challenge problems. And in 2008, they got a bunch of smart people together and said, so what are the engineering opportunities in the 21st century? And if you look at the 14 that they came up with, um, first, you won't find uh, as standalone items uh, faster computers and better communication systems. Uh, you'll find a lot in here about environmental issues, human health issues, uh, energy issues, and so on. And it's, it's certainly true that embedded in many of these uh, are faster computers and better communication systems, but they're not explicit goals uh, like they have been arguably uh, over the last several decades. So if we, I think if you were to ask the same group of people who put those 14 together to uh, update it today, decade later, uh, probably they would uh, substitute some and add some. You might find electrifying transportation, uh, fully renewable, um, smart energy systems, and, and so on. But the list, nonetheless, is different uh, than the traditional uh, computing communication systems that uh, have driven electrical engineering for uh, decades. So the question I'd like to think a little bit about here with you this morning is, is the following. Uh, if, there is, if you pick any of these areas, pick energy systems or uh, sustainable uh, environmental systems or something like that, if there is no roadmap, if there's no ITRS, um, no Moore's Law that defines how the technology will evolve over a period of time, then how in the world are the people who are working on materials and devices and technology, how are they gonna know what to work on? You know, there's nothing which says, here's, here's what's needed from a system perspective in order to produce progress. Or you could write the question the other way. If there's no roadmap, then how are the people who are working on system solutions in these emerging areas, how are they gonna know what's possible? Because there's no roadmap which says, Two years from now, you're going to have twice as many transistors, and they're going to be twice as fast, and so on and so forth. There's nothing equivalent to that in any of these other uh, application areas. So the solution, obviously, is we need to be thinking much more in a much more interdisciplinary fashion. We cannot have the separation of technology and systems people that we got by with uh, in the computing and communications era because we had Moore's Law in the ITRS as the glue between the two worlds. So what does this mean for electrical engineering? Not just our department, but electrical engineering departments, uh, I think, nationwide. So it, as I mentioned a minute ago, certainly computers and communication systems are foundational to many of the NAE grand challenge areas going forward, but they're not an end in themselves, uh, which arguably they, they have been for the last several uh, decades. 
And I think if, if, if we, as a department, you know, focus on the things that have made us great in the past, uh, then increasingly we're going to be less relevant to the solution of 21st century problems. If you take the NAE Grand Challenge or your own set of them, uh, the things that EE has been so terrific at and, and been uh, done so well at, I think, are, are not the problems uh, of the 21st century. So hiring the best and the brightest, I would argue, while it's necessary, it's not sufficient for electrical engineering departments to actually uh, have the dominant role uh, in engineering schools and so on going forward that they've had going backward. So here's, the, here's a picture of the situation, I think. If you look at any of the system application areas on the right side, uh, even information systems, uh, the traditional communication and, and computing systems, but certainly energy systems, transportation systems, and so on, all of these grand challenge problems. And you look at the technology foundations that will help provide solutions in each of these areas, there is nothing like Moore's Law or the ITRS that provides the bridge between those two. So we can't get away with sort of working in isolation. I think if we really want to find efficient, optimal solutions to these uh, 21st century problems. So what does this mean for electrical engineering? So the first question I think we could uh, ask ourselves is let's just be specific to Stanford and let's look and, and say, so who, who here at Stanford you know, is leading uh, the programs in energy, environmental issues, in uh, human health issues, and smart grid issues, and personalized medicine? These are all part and parcel of the 21st century grand challenges. And I'll, I'll leave it to you to look up um, those. Stanford has a bunch of institutes and everything else. You can look up and see who the names of the people are that are leading these things. And you won't find many electrical engineering faculty uh, playing leadership roles in these initiatives here at Stanford. So now, arguably, electrical engineering has uh, faculty and programs that span physics to mathematics. And so, in fact, if you wanted to pick a department at a, at a place like Stanford that could provide leadership in some of these emerging areas, I don't think you'd pick any department other than electrical engineering. I mean, we've got the tools, we've got the people, we've got the history of doing this successfully in computing, computing and communication systems, uh, and the opportunity is there for us to take this on in some new areas. Now, you could look back and say, uh, historically, we've been really good at this, and you know, the example is communication systems, computing systems, but actually, I think we were lucky. Uh, that, that we were good at that, and we were lucky because the ITRS and Moore's Law uh, kind of built the bridges between the technology solutions and the systems people who wanted to use that technology to solve interesting problems. <clears throat> so, um, all of the NAE 21st century challenges are system level interdisciplinary problems um, without exception. Uh, EE, I think if you look around at our portfolio right now, we've got C activities in many of these areas, uh, but I think we're not uh, leading any of these areas currently at Stanford. So last spring, uh, electrical engineering actually created a uh, strategic plan for the department as part of a five year cycle visiting committee. And if you take out that um, uh, visiting committee, uh, the, the strategic plan that was prepared, I just put one sentence uh, in, in here that's part of it, and it says, for the past half century, there was a focus on semiconductor devices and the information systems and information technology enabled. It's been a great run, uh, but it is clear that the E department is again at a point of transition. So I think I completely agree with this. That's where we are, and it was recognized in the uh, in the strategic plan for the department. So opportunities that were identified uh, for EE, sustainable energy, biosensing, uh, bioelectronics, robotics, quantum engineering, uh, others as well. These are all listed as interesting opportunities going forward for electrical engineering. So the question I would ask then, uh, uh, fine, we, if we agree with this, what's an actionable plan for electrical engineering uh, to uh, take advantage of these and to position itself to actually be in a leadership position for the next several decades, uh, equivalent to what we've been in for the last several decades. So what's an actionable plan? Um, this is just one person's suggestion, but um, and I hope we'll have some more discussion about this during the course of the day. 
I think we should debate and argue about which of these interesting 21st century areas uh, we really think we can make an impact on. Uh, and uh, that debate should be ongoing, continuous, and, and uh, essentially a living document as we look at opportunities that the department has. Um, if we can converge on one or more opportunities, that would be great. Uh, if we can't, uh, then we should actually, I think, seed a bunch of these areas and let's see what grows in terms of programs that electrical engineering can uh, provide leadership in. I think the key to all of this, uh, and this has been the key historically in computing and communication systems, is that mid-career faculty who want to take on a mission have to step up. And they have to basically be willing and interested and excited about providing leadership in some of these new areas. Because without that, you know, we're going to be great at uh, computing systems and communication systems, and we're going to continue to dabble in semiconductors and so on, but we're not going to be driving uh, the research agenda for these major opportunities in the 21st century. So I would hope uh, that out of this would come uh, the development of a bold, actionable plan, uh, which would include uh, people we ought to be hiring. It would include facilities. It would include industry partners and funding opportunities to build significant programs here in these 21st century areas. This is exactly what EE did in computers and communication systems 40 years ago. And we've seen the run that it provided for, uh, for this department and for other EE departments around the country finally execute the plan. So just, uh, I, I'm not proposing which of these areas are interesting, but if you look at some of the NAE 21st century goals, of course, integrated smart grids, you know, there are all these wonderful system level pictures of things. When I look at this, it looks to me like a complex communications computing system, uh, which e EE would be ideally suited to lead because of the breadth of, our, of, of people we have in the department and the breadth of, of work currently going on in the department. You look at peer institutions and who's leading these activities uh, in areas like this, it's, it's actually EE faculty who are doing a lot of this at some of our peer institutions. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, electrified uh, transportation, the same statement. Uh, this looks like a very complex communications computing system, our core expertise. Uh, EE, I think, is ideally suited to provide real leadership in these areas and uh, think about everything from the technology to system architecture and putting something together in very much the same way we did with uh, computing and communication systems. And again, you look at our peer institutions at who's leading some of these kinds of programs and it is EE faculty. And finally, um, something that's near and dear to my heart, um, given my technology background, Stanford has uh, you know, if you're going to actually have people working on technology for these system applications, uh, then you need to be able to make things and you need to be able to build things. And um, unfortunately, Sanford was in a leadership position 30 years ago in building some of the very first uh, microfabrication, now nanofabrication facilities. We now have essentially the oldest such facilities in any of our peer institutions. And if you look at uh, places like MIT, for example, the picture on the right is MIT.nano, which uh, has an aspiration of raising a billion dollars to not only build, the building is built now, but to equip it and sustain it and so on over a period of time. We may not agree with the vision for th that building, but nonetheless, our peer institutions are making big investments in maker facilities to enable them to contribute across a range of application areas going forward. And if you look at who has led the design, the fabrication, the thinking, and the execution of these kinds of facilities, it's been double E faculty. That's the case at MIT right now, all the way up to the president and provost. So I think if we're going to take on some of these 21st century opportunities and we decide we need new facilities, maker facilities of one kind or another, it's this group that really ought to help define what they are and provide leadership in executing on such a plan. So let me finish up uh, and conclude. Uh, I think, you know, if you were, if we were here 50 years from now and looking back on the previous 50 years, it's almost certainly the case that the major accomplishments in engineering at that time are going to be in sustainability, energy, transportation, electrification, human health, and so on. So if we want EE departments to be not, you know, important influential departments in an ongoing basis, I think these are the areas we've got to take a look at and how we can play a major role and provide leadership in. 
So they're, they're huge, exciting opportunities. I think uh, everyone would probably agree on that. And in fact, they're going to inspire the best students and attract the best faculty uh, to wherever these programs are being led and wherever these programs are being executed going forward. Interestingly, uh, almost all of them require EE core competencies, uh, the ability to think from technology to systems and to catalyze interdisciplinary solutions to really complex problems. I think that's who we are. That is what we do. And if, if not us, then who is going to lead these activities uh, over the next uh, several decades? So I think you know, we can, if we wish, uh, provide a, a, leading play, a leading role uh, in, in any or perhaps even all of these areas, or we can choose not to. And if we choose not to, uh, then I think uh, we're going to be less central to the solutions. And the golden era of electrical engineering over the last several decades is not going to be replicated over the next several decades. And that's a choice we can make, I think, uh, either way. So. If, my final point, if we want to provide a leading role in some or all of these areas, we, we must do what we've done for the last uh, 50 years, which is to lead. So thank you very much. Um, working across the particular disciplines, how do you encourage the, the uptick? So I loved that there's no map, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I don't love there's no map. We need a map. But like electrifying transportation, we don't have a map there either. In fact, I was loved seeing the Marguerite, which I used to ride back in the day, was not electrified, it is now. But the reality is, is those buses cost 3x what a diesel or a gasoline powered. So for a public institution like the ones I run, how do I convince the taxpayer dollars this is good use of their money mm -hmm. when we don't have a price on carbon, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So I guess two things. One is, you know, how do you think about getting adoption at scale. And the second one is, would you ever consider partnering with an institution that has spent 10 billion on building nano facilities but doesn't have the, necessarily the academic horsepower to fill it? Mm -hmm. I might know one. Yeah, so, so um, <laughs> I mean, this, this is probably worthy of a much longer uh, discussion, uh, but I, let me just make uh, one or two uh, points. Um, as I've thought about this, you know, I think looking backward in time, uh, the thing that stands out to me is that we actually didn't have to build these interdisciplinary teams, and we didn't have to worry so much about scaling because we had this glue, you know, that held everything together, which was Moore's Law ITRS. And I actually personally didn't fully recognize that until I started thinking about it uh, quite recently. And going forward, we don't have that in any of these areas. And so the, the model has got to be very different, you know, I think in terms of how we think about integrating technology and systems people and getting them to work together effectively. And you know, if you look at, uh, take Stanford as an example, I mean, we've, um, we've created a lot of institutes. You know, we have the Precord Institute for Energy, we've got the Woods Institute for Environmental Things, and th this is, was intended in many ways to be an umbrella structure to kind of do just that, you know, to bring technology and, and systems people together to have them think collectively about uh, integrated solutions to some of these problems. And they've done, I think, some really good things. But uh, frankly, um, when I look at them and, and I ask, so who are the people who really could contribute to this? It's electrical engineers. And I don't see them, uh, us, I don't see us stepping up and really trying to play a significant role in helping Stanford as one entity to create integrated solutions to these kinds of complex problems. Um, what I come up against is people saying to me, why should I make that change? Why should I take one less trip? Why should I eat one less hamburger a week? Which if we all did that would reduce our carbon footprint by 50 million tons a year. And so if we had some way of connecting the dots so that you know every time you do something that it goes somewhere in the cloud into a network where people get access to that and it could encourage the adoption at scale. I don't know. It, I just think that's something where we could be a leader. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, as I, I say, I hope we'll have a continuation of that discussion. Yeah. Um, so I think we're running quite far behind. Maybe I should, oh. I've just got one, one question for you. you. You know, you talk about uh, sort of objectives. I mean, in the business world, clearly getting disparate organizations to do the same thing is setting clear corporate objectives and things like that. 
you know, f for lack of the ITRS, other countries are playing that role. I mean, the Asian developing countries, starting from whether it was Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and now China, have played a big role in setting direction, in very clear direction, mm -hmm. for where their technology or their industries go to. And, you know, having worked in China for the last mm -hmm. 14 years, it's very clear about the direction, and it does provide the glue for mm -hmm. where to go, and it's a dependable policy. And so, uh, you know, it ties into my other point, which is, you know, you know the, the being a leader also has responsibility. You talk about the dominance of doubly and going through and, and surrounded by a table of, of leaders that have gone beyond their departments into other things. Um, being in engineering and being in technology, we've been able to have the luxury to afford not addressing other issues, whether it's public policy issues or mm -hmm. society and staying out of those. Mm -hmm. I think we're in an era and a cusp, both for the, industry, the technology industry as well as our school, where we can't afford to ignore those anymore and, and pretend those are things that are dealt with on the other side of the campus. Right. And so how, how do you see that? It's a tricky road. I mean, you know, we have leaders here that have had to face those things by, by virtue of their responsibilities, but how do you, it's a tar baby too, right? Once you get involved, it's, but, but on the other hand, it, it, we're so dominant now in all these things of what we've done, you can't avoid it and you mm -hmm. can't shirk that responsibility. So right. how, how does that play into it, whether it's ethics <laughs> or whether it's public yeah. policy? Or, yeah, well, I mean, this is all part of the general discussion. You know, I think um, I, I, I'm not personally a big fan of top-down uh, direction in programs. Um, I think you can find as many, uh, if you look at some, you know, country-managed things uh, historically, you can find as, as many failures at least as successes. I think, if, but, but on the other hand, uh, doing it bottoms up is really hard. Uh, getting different kinds of people to work together and find ways to collaborate and cooperate and so on where they each, where it's win-win for everybody. But if we can find ways to do that uh, going forward, I, I personally like that solution better uh, because you get the people who understand the technology and understand the systems and understand the public policy issues and so on working together at that level. And that's really where the solutions are gonna come from, not from, uh, in my view at least, a, a high level top down driven direction uh, but others may disagree you know and I think at some point um, the, we, we all sh should all be interested in finding optimal uh, solutions to very complex problems and the strategy for doing that I guess the main point I was trying to make is the strategy for doing that has to be different uh, than what we have used in double E departments for the last several decades because we don't have Moore's Law and we don't have the ITRS so we've got to work together uh, much more effectively than we have in the past so I, sh I should stop thank you <laughs>